So first I want to say good morning and uh, thanks for, for joining me first thing to talk about how I spend my summer vacation. Uh, as a side note, <coughs> if you search for spend in the present tense, not spent, you will find nothing. But the movie Get the Gringo was called How I Spent My Summer Vacation in the UK. So uh, I thought that was funny. So it has nothing to do with any of these things. Um, but I thought I would, uh, <laughs> I thought I would start with that because it was a little funny. Oh no. Sorry, my mouse was in the wrong spot. And I've ruined everything. All right, so I've called this transferring data or how I spend my summer vacation. Um, I work at a college, so my summer is pretty much spent replacing, re-imaging, or installing new computers, and a big part of that is transferring data. Uh, if you read the brief on the schedule, you know I'm planning to talk about uh, a few ways that you can transfer data and the pros and cons that I've encountered. Um, but I also kind of wanted to open this up as a little bit of a discussion, so if somebody has any points or questions, we have the catch box, which if you haven't seen is a fun, spongy, throwable uh, microphone. <coughs> and close your computer, don't, don't have your water bottles open, and so on. Um, so first, uh, does anybody here work in education? Is that, oh good. So I guess you guys got what I was going for, <laughs> because I thought that the, the reference would be important, that that's what I do. Um, does anybody else schedule their replacements over the summer when students or faculty are not here? <laughs> if you're lucky, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> Basically, my entire summer ends up being these replacements. We don't really do summer classes. Um, and because of that, most of the time, I can replace everything during the summer without really uh, interrupting anybody. <clears throat> All right, first let me introduce myself. That is my portrait that they took at the college. Um, my name is Adam Wickert. This is my second time at uh, Mac Admins, but it's my first time presenting here. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for picking this one because, uh, truthfully, if I wasn't in this one, I would probably be in the cyber defense one, which is really cool. So thank you for, uh, for choosing that. It was, it was, they actually opened a second, there's a second room if you guys want to go. Um, it reminds me of the time I went to the Warp Tour and Rancid was playing on one, one side and I went to see Me First in the Gimme Gimmies and they opened by saying, we're the band that's not as popular as Rancid. <laughs> so that's how I feel. <clears throat> you might remember me from such presentations as social media and policy in your organization at the SASA annual conference in 2014, which I doubt any of you went to because unless you work at a SUNY school in upstate and auxiliary services, you probably wouldn't have seen it. But I did give a great presentation, so much so that a company paid me to do it a second time. It isn't. They didn't record anything because it's like a semi-private event. <laughs> you might also remember me if you're one of the 16 members of the Morbo Slack channel on the Mac Admin Slack. I'm the little UFO guy who quotes, posts quotes in the wrong order all the time. See? Oh, okay. That's me. A. Wickert. Okay, so I also post in other things. Car Chat, that's another one. I do actual work too, but I spend a lot of time in there for whatever reason. The reason is because I'm bored. All right, so I work at Hamilton College as a desktop system administrator. I've been there for about a year and a half, and I work on things uh, like remote management of systems, uh, software installations, deployments, configuration, and uh, I support, or support rather department-owned labs with specialty configurations. We have a lot of sciences, uh, and they have these labs with really weird software needs, and they have a whole bunch of I don't know what you want to call them, data files that also sometimes are programming files that all need to be put there together so that each person who sits down at that computer can use it. So um, that's one of the things that I do. I also run a bunch of outdated systems on Windows XP because apparently a lot of equipment still runs on Windows XP because they don't ever open it and to something new. Anyway, so well, you might well, whew, sorry. You might be wondering why am I qualified. Aside from my years of experience in Mac support, I've worked at electronics retail. I worked at a Circuit City, which was located under a Bally's Total Fitness. What was great about that is anytime somebody dropped a weight, stuff fell off the ceiling. <laughs> it was like constant rain, but the rain was dry. It was really weird. I worked at the Geek Squad, uh, where I was a counterintelligence agent, and I pioneered the, uh, the Chuck Taylors with a tie look that was popularized on NBC's Chuck. I then uh, found out that they actually provided shoes and the entire uniform, but I started and nobody ever told me that, so 
turns out that I was wrong. Um, then I worked at an Apple store. This is act the actual Apple store. It, is a, it was a mini at the time. It has since expanded to a much larger store. Uh, and I worked as a genius to become an expert. Well, not an expert, because now expert's a position at Apple, but I, I just learned about you know, Mac and iOS support and hardware and software problems and all that fun stuff. I expanded beyond retail, so I've uh, since worked as a software engineer for Time Warner Cable. I once got a very stern talking to about not making myself an administrator on my computer because IT says I'm not supposed to do that. I Googled how to do it from the like single user mode, and that was years ago, but they told me, we could fire you for this, and I said, oops. I, uh, I worked at an uh, Air Force research lab where I was kind of the Mac guy. That's the entrance to it. I don't think you're supposed to take any pictures any further than the entrance because it is a top secret research lab. I worked in the administrative building, so nothing exciting happened. It was like the people who write checks and stuff, so whatever. But I ended up at Hamilton College uh, up in upstate New York. It's in Clinton. We have a very large campus. It's 1,350 acres. Uh, it's south of Utica, 45 minutes east of Syracuse, if you're familiar with the upstate New York area. Some, somebody knows. That's cool. Really? That's where I'm from. I mean, that's not where I live now, but that's where I grew up. <laughs> Did you recognize me? I used to be behind the Genius Bar there a lot. My head was over everybody else's, so you could always see me through the group. All right, anyway, uh, Hamilton is the third oldest college in New York. That's just a fun fact. I don't know if it really does anything for anybody, but that's the thing. All right, so what does that mean? All that experience has had me transfer a lot of data. Uh, people buy new computers. I've replaced them at you know, retail, and I've transferred data because even if they didn't offer it, like when I worked at Circuit City, that wasn't a thing, but they made us do it anyway. Like They started FireDog services later. I think it was FireDog. So I still had to do it. Uh, at the Apple Store and the Geek Squad, I would upgrade hard drives and replace damaged and broken stuff and transfer the data over whenever I could. I found that there are a few different ways uh, that you can transfer data, and some work better in certain situations than others. Now, you might be thinking, but Adam, shouldn't users be responsible for their own data? I think that yes, they should. Um, that's a technically correct answer, which is, of course, the best kind of correct. And we can all wish that users were responsible for their data, um, as much as I would love for that to be the case. Uh, it has not been the case in any of my experience, and I've been doing this for a good 10 years or so. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things quick. We're not going to talk about the ideal users. Uh, those are the people who know enough to back their stuff up on their own. They maybe use uh, Google Drive or Dropbox or iCloud or some other service provider to back up their stuff. Uh, people who use network storage when it's provided. Uh, those people are great. They're really easy to work with because most of them know what's going on and they're more than willing to work with you to get things set up. Just got to take a quick drink, sorry. I'm talking a lot. So the other thing we won't talk about is the people who know enough to be dangerous. And I'm sure you guys have probably experienced that, right? It seems to be pretty uh, prevalent in academia. You've got people who know what they're doing in a very specific set of instances. And that's great. They're experts in what they do. Uh, but sometimes what they do overlaps enough with IT that they think they're an expert in it. And sometimes they're not. I also realized just now, I forgot, that's actually a default picture of the windmills. But I live in uh, Madison County, and uh, there's tons of windmills in upstate New York. So that's definitely why I left it there, not because I just told you it was the default image. Sure. Shouldn't have told you that. Oh. Ruining everything again. All right, so let's talk data. This is the important part of the presentation. We're going to talk data, because data comes in lots of shapes and sizes, right? Some people have a little. Others have a whole lot. Some situations require transferring just a user's profile. Uh, maybe that's just the user's primary system, the one that sits on their desk. Some situations require transferring some data that is distributed to all users, like a lot of labs maybe have work, pro or work files that need to be worked on for audio or video, or maybe they have uh, 
some simulations that they're going to be running for some biology or chemistry. Um, at Hamilton, we've run into this one interesting issue that I want to bring up, and I don't know if everybody else has really run into this, but uh, feel free to uh, let me know, raise your hand, and I can toss you the catch box if you want to talk about it. Four or five years ago, the MacBook Pro was coming with a 750 gig hard drive. It's a lot of space. It was great at the time, uh, but right now these new models come with a 256 gig solid state drive. It's awesome because it's fast, um, but it is a little bit of an issue for those people who we might think of as uh, data hoarders. <laughs> so now we've got to deal with transferring data, but also making sure it fits on the drive. So one of the ways I've done it is we're a uh, Google app, or uh, sorry, G Suite for Education uh, campus. I've tried to work with people to say, hey, we've got free unlimited storage. Put as much of your stuff as you want onto Google Drive, and then you don't have to worry about us transferring it because it'll be there everywhere, all the time, forever, with an asterisk because I don't know what forever really means from Google. But it does work really well, and, and I've actually found some really great uses for it. When we have people who have huge data sets, we've got people who record video for, um, I have a, an aviary that I support for uh, uh, one of our biology professors. <clears throat> and she records video of the crows. And it takes about three terabytes a month worth of video because there are seven 1080p cameras, I think. It's a lot of data. But we've talked about how great it would be that we could use this unlimited storage and not have to keep upgrading her computer that we already put two four terabyte hard drives in. And we also have, uh, this is a, that happens to be on a, on a Windows machine, but it's an all-in-one, and we had to get four terabyte laptop drives, and they're like double thickness, so the back doesn't quite fit on anymore. Didn't, I didn't realize that when we ordered it. You live and learn, right? So I guess this brings up a, a point that I was thinking of earlier, which is that uh, users don't care about their data until something happens. Computers get replaced. Uh, some of us are lucky. It's on a schedule. We know when it's going to happen. For me at Hamilton, that's uh, over the summer when classes aren't in session. Sometimes we're, uh, we're less lucky. It's a uh, failure or damaged hardware. Sometimes computers can be lost or stolen. And unfortunately, we've had this happen a few times since I've been at Hamilton. And people don't really think about what's on their computer until it's not there. Uh, in any of those cases, we, uh, we try our best to get their data, but, you know, we can only do our best. Uh, on my campus, we happen to be using the, uh, the service CrashPlan. CrashPlan does a great job of backing up all of our data to a server, and as long as it's running, most people have a pretty good backup. That's really helpful. Uh, I do joke about the difficult users, but I, I do want to get them to have a good experience and make it, make it so they're trusting in IT and they think that we know what we're doing and that we're helping them and we're there to help them and we're not just the guys who are saying, no, you can't go to this website or no, you can't install the High Sierra beta because we haven't even tested it and as soon as I installed it, my computer crashed. It was because I upgraded my Jamf enrolled system already. I assume that something conflicts because I think it was the encryption, but People try to do it anyway. So you need to transfer data. And you've got options. Uh, you can pick a source. You've got a direct connection. You can do target disk mode from the old computer. You can have an external hard drive with a backup or the files copied to it. Or the original drive connected in the sled, that might come up if uh, you've had a hardware failure. Obviously, that particular one only really works well on something with a removable drive, not so much with the blade storage on the newer MacBook Pros. You can use the network connection and connect the original machine over the network. <coughs> or you can use a uh, internet or cloud solution like CrashPlan or Carbonite or even the iCloud desktop and documents in the cloud that'll pull some of that stuff down. You can pick a method. We've got uh, the Migration Assistant. Everybody knows Migration Assistant. That's a great one for home use. You can drag and drop the files that are important. That could be fast. Or you can use the command line or the third-party backup software that comes with your chosen solution. 
But before we get too far, we're going to think about some of the complications that, uh, that you might run into. You've got uh, outdated OS versions. So I don't know how everybody deals with this, but uh, we currently don't upgrade everyone's OS on a regular schedule. So somebody who has a four-year-old computer probably still has a four-year-old OS unless they specifically asked to have it upgraded. In our, uh, in our <coughs> environment, it doesn't really hurt anything, uh, but we do run into that software doesn't work because it's outdated or too new and there's always those kind of mismatches. Um, and you've got also the things like if you're coming from Lion to Sierra, well, you've got some preferences that are no longer the same. So when you transfer them, it doesn't really work the way that you thought it might. Uh, switching platforms is a complication. We have people who sometimes want to go from Windows to Mac or Mac to Windows. We're not going to talk about that one. But when you switch platforms, it pretty much has to be a drag and drop. Although Migration Assistant does support it, it really only works if they're an excellent Windows user who only stores their documents in the Documents folder and their pictures in the photos. And if they don't do that, then you are losing a whole bunch of stuff. And unfortunately, that happens. We know what happens. People don't follow the instructions. Because they don't know where the instructions are, I guess. Uh, this is the one that I'm probably going to harp on the most when I'm talking here today, is that enterprise environments have a whole bunch of interesting complications. Um, you've got Active Directory binding that some people may have. I know Nomad is real popular to keep you from having to bind from Active Directory, but not everybody has the luxury of choosing whether or not your IT department says that you are binding to AD. You've got uh, some AD binding. Oh, I already said that one. You've got uh, MDM solutions. Mobile device management uh, is great, uh, and tools like Monkey can really help uh, if you're not in a full MDM environment. Uh, they can distribute those um, configuration profiles and policies, but the way that they're distributed and the times that they're distributed can sometimes conflict with data transfer, because if you transfer certain permissions that are set one time, you may have to do it a second time. And you may not know that you have to do that until you've experienced the fact that it didn't work. We've got permissions. Permissions is another one that I'm going to mention a whole lot, and that's because they're not always preserved in every situation. There's, I've tested so many of these things that I haven't figured out 100% what is right and what is wrong when transferring to make them sometimes have no permissions that match, even though it looks like they should. But there's ways to fix it. And of course, corrupt data is a potential issue that we can run into too. Um, it's something that they probably don't even know until they go to access the file. Um, the hardware could be failing, there could have been a bad software update, it could have been a bad transfer that they just didn't know because they downloaded the file and never had to open it until now. So I've got Migration Assistant up there. Um, that's the first one we're going to talk about. It's probably the easiest method for home use. Uh, it might be one of the tougher ones to use in the, uh, in the enterprise. So we've got some pros. It's easy. You click a few buttons. And away you go. The permissions should be preserved on any local accounts that you transfer over. And you can use a variety of sources. It'll work from a direct connection or over a network. But it's not that easy. There's always cons. We've got software. This is probably the biggest one that people run into when transferring that, uh, that we experience, at least. We've got people who transfer these old applications that no longer work on the new version of the US. Um, <clears throat> we've got activation that doesn't transfer over, or license files that won't transfer over. Microsoft Office is a big one that people are like, oh, I'm going to transfer Office from my old computer to my new one. And the licensing doesn't transfer it that way. Network settings. Sometimes they don't transfer as expected. I don't have a good explanation for this. I just know that it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes the uh, wireless profiles work fantastic. Sometimes you have to blow everything away and start it over. But that just seems to be that, the, again, probably something with different versions of the OS transferring. And back to enterprise issues, Active Directory accounts and permissions, those can be affected. 
MDM profiles, I mentioned that already. Depending on the order that you transfer data and apply those, they may or may not work in the way that you intend without running them again. Also, it made this computer crash uh, when I was putting the presentation together because I was trying to take some screenshots. It's totally crashed, I don't know why. We could talk about how easy it is. Um, Migration Assistant does all of the heavy lifting for you. All you need to do is select the connection type, select what you want to migrate. You've got the option here to pull from a Mac, Time Machine, Backup, Startup Disk, from a Windows PC or to another Mac, which is, of course, if you're doing it over the network, you need to make that selection. I know that this is uh, all pretty elementary stuff, but I did say that it was a uh, introductory level basics. So you can then select the drive. In this case, we're going to pick the work time machine because this is the screenshot that's available on Apple's website. Because again, my computer crashed when I was trying to do this. And then you've got the applications, the users, files and folders, computer network settings. In the case that I think most of us would be using it, uh, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, we're probably just going to uh, select the user account because when you have IT support, some of those other things, like applications, might be delivered in a different way. Um, and the same thing with computer network settings. A lot of that stuff is also going to be delivered in a separate, a separate way. <coughs> I personally don't find this to be a particularly effective solution. Um, I do have some colleagues in the New York Six that, uh, that have had great success with it. Uh, the New York Six is a consortium of six liberal arts colleges in upstate New York that include Hamilton, Colgate, uh, Skidmore, St. Lawrence, Hobart, William Smith, and Union. And uh, they work together for a whole bunch of things, but some of the IT stuff is that we work together as a group to get better pricing, or sometimes we just work together as a group in order to have better standards that we can work across multiple, relatively small campuses. Then we can talk about drag and drop, unless anybody wants to talk about Migration Assistant some more. And if we do, I've got the catch box. We can throw it out. All right. We're going to start with the catch box. You got a hold of that? I don't want to, I don't want to knock over your, your coffee. All right. All right. So uh, we were using Migration Assistant at work the way we should not be. <laughs> Um, and we've run into a very deep problem with Office 2016 in that if you use Migration Assistant, it appears that Outlook will no longer index your mail. We've ripped out uh, Spotlight, Root, and Branch, re-indexed re the entire drive, zero effect. We set up a new user profile re-downloaded the user, these three users, gigabytes worth of email, no effect. The only thing that worked was ripping out Office, the entirety of it, root and branch, down to everything oh. and reinstalling it. So my question is, do you know of any better way? Have you experienced this or anything of the like? <laughs> I think, I think my answer would probably end up being uh, to try one of the other <laughs> transfer <laughs> options. Um, we don't actually use Outlook. Uh, f because we're a, a G Suite campus, basically everybody is primarily on the web uh, for their email. Uh, we actually don't even deploy Outlook, even though we have Office on every computer. We do have some people who still use Thunderbird because from some decision years ago, they switched from something that was no longer being supported and decided to go with Thunderbird. And every so often, anybody have any fun stories about that? We can talk about somebody made a weird decision that you don't understand. That's one that I'm not, I'm not sure I follow because I don't think it's really relevant anymore to have Thunderbird. But, but. Does anybody have any other thoughts or ideas on what might come up with uh, the issue mentioned on Office? Do you want assistant, no. I think migration assistant is really bad even at home. Yeah. My users complain about it at the home level. I can't imagine using it at work. It, it, it was a quick way for somebody when I was not in the office. It's still to, really slow, though. 
really, I mean, yeah, it can be slow. slow. There's, there, like I said, it's not necessarily optimal for a lot of things, but I think for home users, it's easy. Yeah. And I think ease is probably what, what picks it up. You want the catch box? You guys got, be careful with the, <laughs> everybody just starts grabbing everything. <laughs> All right, is this, everybody can hear me? The, one of the things that I do if I need to use Migration Assistant is I will go to the source machine before I ever grab a Thunderbolt cable or something else, and I'll boot to single user mode and do an FSCK on the drive and just make sure that the drive is as solid and reliable as I think it can be and, the, and that the file system is as preened as I think I can make it. Um, if the machine, if somebody's moving from an old machine to a new machine, sometimes the old machine is starting to develop hardware issues mm -hmm. where the old drive is just not reading things reliably. And that really makes it feel really slow when it's moving stuff away. Um, but I try to do as much homework as I can in advance of the transfer. And th that, maybe it's just voodoo, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to help a lot. Um, and, and sometimes FSCK will pick up stuff that um, you might not, not otherwise find. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great tip, too. It's uh, FSCK. For, is everyone familiar with FSCK? I don't want to gloss over things if nobody knows what we're talking about. But oh, yeah, so um, FSCK is a, uh, a Unix-based um, file system checker command. Um, it's similar to, I th and, and Patrick can probably tell me if I'm wrong, it's similar to what would happen with disk utility if you booted to yeah, recovery it mode. It would be essentially the same thing, depending on exactly how you're addressing the disk that you are um, trying to fix, you may or may not be able to commit those changes if you started from that drive. Right. That you're trying to fix. Okay. You can probably hold on to that for now unless you want to. We can just see if anybody else wants to talk later. We can play toss the catch box. <laughs> oh, we got somebody back there if you want to. Sorry. Hey, no. I, I built in time for talking because this I thought might have some questions or something. I, I just want to preface my remarks by saying we're one of the reasons I'm here today is to see if there's something better than Migration Assistant because we've tried a number of things and I've come up with a scheme for using Migration Assistant that works pretty reliably for me. Um, I agree with you, prep is, is essential. Um, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, um, I think prep is essential. Um, if you've got an old machine that's been beat on for four years, Migration Assistant will move stuff over, but um, if the machine is damaged or not in a sane state, it, it will be unpredictable. So the first thing I do is just go into the user account and I clean. Um, migration Assistant will move over a bunch of stuff that doesn't need to be moved over. Um, so oftentimes I will simply go in and spend a few minutes cleaning in the user account, saved application states, caches, mm -hmm. um, files that I don't need. We use Outlook. Um, I don't have the problem with Outlook you had because we don't use a migrated Outlook account very often. It's on the server. So I just blow it away and download the mail from the server again, and our users are trained not to keep mail locally. Um, That'd be it, great. There's just no percentage in doing that for us. Um, but yeah, it, if you prep, I've used migration assistance successfully on everything I've done pretty much for the past five years. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm migrating systems at the rate of, you know, a <coughs> couple, three a week sometimes. So it works reliably if you do your prep work. Mm -hmm. I also use target disk mode almost exclusively. Um, you cut out the OS, you cut out the network latency, and it, over a FireWire or Thunderbolt connection, it's, it's reasonably fast. It's as fast as anything else I've ever used in that, in that case. And like I said, I'd, I'd love to find something better. I mean, that's, that's a good point. Uh, prep is a, a great point because that comes into what I mentioned earlier where we have these big drives going to small drives. And knowing that people have more data in advance, you can help them prep for how to, to move that stuff around. And uh, talking about kind of prepping manual stuff, I guess, or, or do you have like a script that goes through? It's pretty much manual. Okay. There's only a couple of things that I get and I try and do it as quickly as possible. And certainly some of those things will help. And like I said, I have, I have colleagues who use Migration Assistant very effectively. I'm not necessarily saying it's bad. I think that the primary issue that I run into has to do with the fact that um, our AD bound accounts don't get the permissions transferring correctly when you transfer through Migration Assistant. 
I don't know why, but... To the best my knowledge, Migration Assistant will not move AD accounts. Well, it's, it's all the stored local stuff in the user folder will move over. It just doesn't... same UIDs and the same accounts, right. um, you're probably going to have a bad time. It <laughs> might let you log in, but if they can't find the authentication authority up in directory services, it might be unhappy. I have to delete the account, rebind, and then re-log in, and it'll reassociate the, the user. I see what they're doing. In my experience, I've found it that it's very, very useful in converting an AD account to a local account. I am the opposite. I don't prep the old machine at all. I don't even touch it except for grab the data because I don't want to clean anything that will be used in the future. Or not, not used in the future, but if someone comes back and say, oh, I need that file. Mm -hmm. So after I move to a new machine, I keep the old computer for several months and don't deploy it because I'm busy deploying other things. Yeah, we do something similar. We, when we deploy a new machine, we'll do the data transfer. Uh, as requested, and then we hold on to the computer, usually for a couple of weeks, uh, sometimes a little more than that, really depending on the, the situation, how many we have sitting uh, in the queue. Correct. We got somebody else back there who want to pass the catch box. Oh. <laughs> we have a one-to-one -one program, <clears throat> about a thousand students. Uh, every three years, we rotate our equipment. Uh, and we ask that every student back up their computer to an external hard drive. And we use Migration Assistant to migrate from the backup hard drive to a newly imaged machine. Mm -hmm. And so I've done this uh, about 2,500 times now. And I can maybe count on one hand the number of times I've seen a failure. But we migrate only the user folder. Yeah, so. and that's definitely, it's definitely helpful. All, all these tips are great. Like I said, um, a lot of what I'm coming to tell you is from my personal experience. and. In the enterprise, maybe it's Active Directory stuff. Maybe it's uh, some of the things that we push out with our MDM. We use Jamf Pro. Uh, those can be some of the things that can conflict. But everybody's environment is a little bit different. No matter what you do, even if you try to set up two things exactly the same in point A and point B, at some point they're going to deviate a little bit. And I actually make this point. I made this point later in the presentation. A computer will do exactly what you ask it to do, but maybe not what you want it to do. <laughs> All right. Um, unless anybody else wants to keep talking about Migration Assistant, we can talk about drag and drop, which is pretty easy. But it's going to be time consuming, too. So uh, we've got pros and cons again. We're going to go back to that. It's easy, super easy. You click and then you drag. The only thing I ever have a problem with is the new track pads, but I can't get it to hold when I drag. You like have to press it kind of, I don't know, I can't, I can never do it on the first try. This one also works from uh, pretty much any source. Network, direct connection, internet backups. It's super easy to just pull from literally any window to any other window. Of course, there's cons. Um, it's manual. No matter what you do, a drag and drop is going to be manual. It requires that interaction in order to make it happen. Um, whether you're copying uh, all the pieces at once in the whole user folder, or if you're just copying piece by piece, whichever you decide works best. It can be time consuming, especially if you are picking and choosing what to copy. When you go through and say, I'm only going to take the documents and the desktop, but also you want to make sure that you get the user's doc and desktop preference files so that it looks the same, um, but you're not going to copy the pictures because you don't think that pictures are work related. <coughs> Hidden files can be a problem because they're not included when you drag unless they are within the folder. So if you select like this, where I'm just dragging everything, the library folder shouldn't be transferred because I didn't actually select it. But if you select the folder above it, then it will transfer. And then permissions. This is something that we can talk all day about, and I'm sure some people will say that it will work perfectly. And some people will say that it never works. And some people will say sometimes it works. I'm in a sometimes it works camp on this one. And that's because there are ways that it will work correctly. And there are ways that it won't. 
Um, you can sometimes get around it if you copy the contents of the folder into the folder of the new user as long as that folder has already been created because it should transfer everything that way correctly. That's, again, that manual you're doing each folder separately. Takes some time. Um, if you copy the entire user folder, it may not transfer the preferences or the, the permissions, but it might. It depends. If it's a local user and you create a uh, local account with that same short name, then it absolutely will take, a, take it over and it'll work perfectly. If you're using that AD bound account, then as we kind of talked about earlier, then sometimes you have to unbind and rebind or sometimes you have to change the permissions on that account so that it does match again. So a walkthrough on this one, there's not a whole lot. Click, drag. Um, in this case, I'm taking the contents of the user folder. Um, what usually happens when you do this, this is my user folder from one computer to my user folder on a new computer. They should try to just merge them. It'll actually ask you what you want to do, but usually if you just merge them, the permissions work correctly. But that also requires somebody to have already logged in and created the account. Um, I don't know if anybody does this, but when we have new users come in, um, we actually create the account with a temporary password, so we set up a whole bunch of stuff for them so that they're logged into our crash plan server already, so they're getting backed up, they're logged into their email. All that stuff has already happened. Um, so if this works great if we're doing that, but how often do we transfer data for new users? We don't transfer a whole lot. Occasionally we get people who come from partner institutions and they have some stuff that they want us to transfer and, and we will, but. That's true. Most people know how to use a USB drive to, uh, to transfer stuff. You can uh, transfer the data within each folder. We talked about that, but that again means you go to each documents folder transfer the folder from one, or the contents from one folder to the other folder. Permissions should work just fine because you're now putting it into a folder that has their correct permissions. And you can copy the entire user folder. Um, if you copy the entire user folder, you may need to create the new local user like I mentioned, um, or you might have to change ownership and chone the folder to give the correct user permissions or unbind and rebind to AD uh, if, you, if you do this, you can get some good feedback from your users because they're going to like the fact that their settings are all the way that they were. And when they sit down at this computer, even though it's a new computer, it feels like their old one. If, uh, if you don't want to do it this way, then like I mentioned earlier, taking the doc and desktop uh, plist files, those two alone make most people feel like it's the same computer again, just because it looks the same. Sure, you might get some of those question marks in the doc, if you haven't installed the applications that they have. But um, the way that we tend to do this, at least, is we ask what specialty programs people need. And we try to have them installed beforehand, or at least have them provided in self-service so that they can install it on their own. Excuse me. Does anybody want to talk about uh, drag and drop for file transfer? It's pretty manual. I don't know if there's anybody who uses that as a primary. If you got the catch box, you want to toss it up oh, this no. way? Okay. So did you want to say anything or just? It works far better with migration assistant. I, I mean, it's far quicker. Yeah, I don't have any issues. No, that's, oh yeah, we got, feel free to talk in the catch box. Extremely large folder or folders and it'll stop the process um, when it hits an error which is a pain because then you don't know how far it's gotten and you've got to start over. Um, any, any insight there? I mean, I know uh, command line might be better, but drag and drop, you're like, it's so simple, but it can take a long time when you have errors. I can answer that to a certain extent. Um, the few times I've seen that, it's been uh, file system damage. Uh, so you do a FSCK on the drive and it usually solves the problem. The other thing that you can do is if you are doing a drag and drop, if you start to drag it over, it'll ask you if you want to replace a file. You can just hit yes to all, or no to all, and then it'll just go to the point where it failed. That might help, at least in the speed. But it might still have an issue with <laughs> the file that, that it failed on. Uh, are you going to talk about BIOS files? I was not going to, but if you want to, you're, you're welcome to. Okay. <laughs> has anybody had problems with BIOS files? 
particularly some unusual software issues that don't understand them or save by save their own BIOS file and then want to use that instead of the global one? No? I, I can't say I've ever had a user who specifically modified or wanted to use anything different, but so it's if, only so I guess it's my it's my it's only my crappy printing software. <laughs> <laughs> Answers my question. Somebody over there had a Good Lord. Um, no, so the BIOS file, for anybody who's not familiar with it, in the hierarchy of various OS X preferences, the BIOS file is something that is typically um, tagged with a unique identifier that ties it back to the computer. So kind of your idea of the BIOS file would be preferences that only make sense on a particular device, uh, say, your last set resolution on a monitor. If you migrate from a 13-inch MacBook Pro to a 15-inch Touch Bar MacBook Pro, there's going to be things like the last resolution that was set that doesn't make sense. Now, that doesn't mean that a developer out there hasn't made a boneheaded decision to save something important in a by host preference that works great until you move it to another machine. And if you've got something that, that, a preference that should reasonably make sense on multiple machines and it's being saved in a by host preference, you might want to contact the developer and say, okay, why are you doing this? Why save this here? Because it creates unhappiness when moving from machine to machine. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm not super familiar with the by host because it doesn't really come up a whole lot. The last time I had any thing I had to deal with, there was some malware thing that tried to modify a couple of things in there, and the only thing I knew was that we were trying to get rid of it so it would create a new one. All right. Um, the next thing I had on here is to talk about the command line. Does everybody have uh, experience with command line? I know I used to work at the Apple store, and we were basically told that the command line is scary and bad. Don't ever use it in front of a user. <laughs> If they see this, they think that we're in the movie Hackers, which is silly because Hackers has those cool 3D animations when they're in the computer. How come nobody has invented that yet? The, the 3D like building looking thing that you can traverse files in? That'd be fun. <laughs> That's an excellent point. It's my favorite movie that Pendula has been in. It's been in like three, I think. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, We've got pros and cons again. I kind of went through and tried to do this for each one. Uh, I think the main pro that we have on the command line is that it is the most precise. Um, you can specify a lot of different uh, flags, and that can help you ensure that the right data is transferred with the correct permissions. The uh, command line can be automated into a script. Um, and that can make it helpful if you do want to do things like make sure you transfer these three folders and these three files, but nothing else. Again, the permissions, some commands should be able to have flags that retain the original permissions and file attributes. And finally, it looks cool, especially if you use the homebrew theme. That's my favorite because it's got the green on black. I think that's fun. It's easy to see. That's good. It's high contrast, right? Um, there's a few cons. Permissions, what? <laughs> Here it is again, I keep saying it, um, and it's because it's the thing that has caused me the most problems uh, over all of my data transfers in all of these places that I have done them. Um, if you don't specify the correct options and f or flags for the permissions, you might need to manually change them after the fact. Um, you have to remember all those options and uh, the options flags uh, to make sure that you are doing the thing that you think you're doing. Like I said, a computer will do exactly what you ask it to, but not necessarily what you want it to. And it can take just as much time as a drag and drop if you're copying things manually uh, instead of copying an entire user folder. The only difference is your interaction instead of being a mouse click is now writing a command. All right. We can do a walkthrough. Uh, the walkthrough on this one is just a quick fake command I wrote for copy using the cp command, which is the copy command. If you guys are familiar, great. If you're not familiar, 
Actually, is anybody like completely unfamiliar with the command line? That's awesome. Uh, I definitely have worked in places where people are afraid of the command line and you never see them touch it. Um, I find that's really useful because like I said, it's a little more powerful in my opinion. Maybe other people's opinions too. Uh, the format here, the copy command CP followed by the options, which uh, I have seen also called modifiers. Sometimes I call them flags. That's the way I learned it. I don't know if one is right or wrong. If you look in the documentation, it usually says options, but right or wrong doesn't really matter in this. Um, the couple flags that I use here are the VF, lowercase p, capital P, capital R, and then, of course, your source and destination. Um, quick explainer there. Here we got the V is verbose. Um, I like that when I'm doing it manually, so it shows me what's happening. And if it's hung up, I can get an idea of at least where it is in the folders. Um, one thing I know is that it's considered non-standard. So if you are using it in a script, you can have some problems, but it's also silly to use in a script because you generally want a script to probably run quiet anyway. <clears throat> We've got the F, which is replace without confirmation. It can be dangerous, but if the file already exists, it just removes and replaces it without asking you. Um, in these kind of situations, it's usually because I'm just copying to either a folder that I already tried and it failed or to a new computer that's never had anything written, it, but it keeps from duplicating things sometimes. The lowercase p is the one that uh, is supposed to be really helpful in preserving our permissions, file attributes like creation date, last access date, owner, ACLs, and I think there's a few other things. Um, the uppercase p shouldn't follow sim links. Symbolic links are somewhat useful, but um, it's also technically a default. But the reason that we're using it is because the uppercase R is recursive and that reverses to follow sim links for some reason. Um, this is a pretty good flag because it, what recursive does in most things is it traverses down through all the subfolders and files and makes it pretty helpful when you're transferring all of that stuff. And in theory, with all these options, uh, when you copy an entire user folder, it should preserve all the correct permissions and files the way that it was on the original system. So when the user logs in, it will seem just like the old one. You can use rsync if you're going to copy over a network. This is something that we've been doing a lot recently so that we don't have to take a user's computer away from them to do a direct connection to transfer. Um, it's remote file sync, and what it should do is compare the file trees and replace only what's different without recopying all the other stuff, which is nice if you've done, excuse me, maybe you've done a transfer and then the user says, oh, I had to log in and change something before this morning when we're going to get that new computer. Can we make sure that we fix that? Well, quickly running this usually, you know, helps that. Uh, the command starts with rsync followed by those modifiers again, slightly different format here where you're logging into basically your other computer user at host name, uh, and then a colon and the, uh, the path for your source on the, uh, the old system. One thing I've noticed uh, when doing this, because like I said, we've been doing this a little recently at work, if you don't make sure that both systems are awake, it may fail partway through, and you don't know exactly where it failed. It's great because rsync will continue where it stopped, but it doesn't necessarily tell me how much time I'm going to be needing. So you can do it with system preferences or by the command line. If you're nowhere near that other remote system, I like to SSH into the system. Uh, so just a quick SSH in there. SSH user at local will ask you for your password. This is something that uh, I find a lot people don't necessarily always know this, but since it doesn't show you what you're typing, people always get confused. These are the maybe less familiar among us who uh, don't use the command line all that much. And after you do that, you can just uh, go in and set the PM set space disk sleep zero, and that should prevent the disk from going to sleep in the time that you're transferring. And since this is probably the old computer, I wouldn't even worry about turning it back because at least when we take a computer back, we usually keep it for a while and then wipe it. I should probably sue to that, actually, just in case. I don't remember. 
All right, the, uh, the computer that you're actually doing the transfer on, on that new computer, you might want to just switch to uh, never put your display to sleep so you can keep watching in case you, like me, are doing four or five at a time and you don't know if you're going to look back at that one before the screen goes to sleep and you have a password required every time that the screen goes to sleep. Is it a huge pain? No. Is it a little annoying? Yes. So we'll do that. I also don't know why they put, put hard disks to sleep when possible. I feel like they should change that because very few of their computers come with hard disks anymore. Well, solid state, right? Well, I guess you can get IMAX with fusion drives. All right, so uh, back to this original command. We had those modifiers I was talking about. For rsync, we've got uh, A, which is archive mode. In this command, that should uh, ensure that everything is preserved, like the attributes, permissions, and ownerships, and so on, uh, when you transfer it. We've got the uh, V for verbose again, because like I said, I love to watch the stuff happen. It looks cool. But really, it, it actually, like I said, it's, it's when you see something happening, you can see what is happening that may be slowing it down. And then Z is to compress data. Uh, I find this one is helpful when we're doing large numbers at a time, because while the school isn't open and maybe students aren't doing things they're not supposed to do, like BitTorrent, not that they're doing that, we have more bandwidth available, but I still like to make sure that I'm not using all of the bandwidth just to transfer data. In theory, when you do this, the users folder is again copied in the same state it was before. And with an AD account, it seems like you can log in just as you did and it works correctly. The last one, and this is not really a commonly used one, um, is ditto. Years ago, I learned that this was great for when a drive is failing. Is that right or wrong? I don't know. Um, but I found that it's helpful when I am in a failing drive. Um, same thing like before, you've got your command ditto, your modifiers, and your source and destination. Um, in this case, V is verbose output, but the capital V, I think on this one, shows only what's successfully copied, if memory serves correctly here. They're, sometimes the wall of text on how they explain these things is difficult. Um, what ditto does is ignore some of the files that begin with a period, .nfs or .afp deleted and it ignores what they say, pipes and sockets. So by ignoring some of this unnecessary stuff, I think on a hard drive that's failing, we're not stressing it quite as much by not trying to copy additional files that may be causing a problem. Uh, it also creates folders if they don't exist, but it merges existing folders instead of overwriting them. That is probably the thing that is most helpful in a failing drive in that it merges and doesn't try to overwrite existing stuff because maybe you get it the second time when you didn't get it the first time. But again, it's my least used and it's really only my last resort when something bad is happening on the drive. Um, the last thing about uh, the command line that I was gonna go over here is kind of the cleanup, and that's the change ownership, because occasionally, even though I've tried to make sure that I've used a method that preserves permissions, whether I did that with Migration Assistant or I did it with dragging and dropping, sometimes I get an error when I have an AD account login. Sometimes the error is obvious, sometimes it's less obvious, and I know that the username and password is correct, but it just shakes at me when I go to log in. So sometimes I go and permission, fix the permissions on the drive, and I use the chone command which is change owner. It's uh, pretty simple. You go sudo, again, because you want to do the super user, you want to do it from an elevated command prompt, not just uh, your, your regular user account. You're going to chone dash r, the user's short name, and then the folder. The uh, dash R is again recursive, so it follows every file and folder. If you don't do that, which every so often I forget to, then some stuff works and then suddenly they have no permission to their documents folder. <laughs> um, I find this useful again. I, I deploy packages sometimes with all those work files that I mentioned in the sciences and they're supposed to go to every user. Sometimes it doesn't. Or sometimes when it does, they can't access those files because it says they don't have permission. I thought that I scripted it that way. But um, I'll go through and just by running this, 
it usually does seem to fix it. Um, it might be overkill, but it also doesn't really hurt anything because this should be setting it back to what it should be anyway. So that's the end of my part on the command line. Does anybody want to talk about the command line or have any different things that they would uh, that they would do or that they do not like? If we can pass the catch box over, maybe. Don't, don't toss. Don't toss. We can, or we can pass it. We can gently pass it. That's okay. I don't want I don't want anybody to get hurt and knock over any. That's enough for one minute. Um. Just in watching what you were doing, I wholeheartedly recommend using rsync over CP, mainly because if anything happens in the middle, you don't have to redo all your work. <laughs> yes. Personally, rsync is my favorite. Um, I didn't want to pick favorites. How can you pick a favorite way to transfer data? They're all so good, except for Migration Assistant. All the rest of them are so good. Um, I, but like I said, that's the reason that we've the re reason that we've been doing it is there are so many pros. Like if it does fail, it continues. Uh, if we are going to take somebody's new computer and give it to them, well, we don't have to give them no computer overnight while we do a data transfer because uh, people like to use their computers. I, I don't know if this is the case every place else, but if they have a laptop, they take it home with them every night. It's their personal computer too. Does that bother me? Not really except when I'm transferring data and I find out they have 700 gigs in their iTunes and nothing else on the computer and they want me to transfer it to a new computer which only has a 256 gig drive. Um, <laughs> it's been a pain this year. I've had, I've had like four or five people who just like, oh, my stuff didn't transfer. It's because you kept everything at the root of the drive when I, was, I did rsync and it worked fine except you have all these extra documents folders on the root of the drive. The only other the trailing backslashes or trailing forward slashes in your path names. I think I actually did that wrong sake. on this, um, but that's mostly because I redid these slides like 18 times. <laughs> you can actually see there's different dates on the top of some of them because I redid them <laughs> after I had done something else. I went back. So, but yes, the, uh, the trailing backslash is really important. Anybody else want to talk about command line? You want to pass that back over? There's a couple things that, that come to mind with the example. The, the first one about rsync being able to recover from an interrupted transfer also comes into play because you mentioned, well, we don't want to take away the machine from the user. And in, I believe it's native format, you could, if somebody had a large amount of data, and they wanted their machine turned over really quickly, that you could run the rsync command, transfer the bulk of their data, mm -hmm. and then two days later, okay, I'm ready for my new machine. You rerun the command, it will catch what has changed, yep. and allow you essentially to do a delta copy, which can make the final transfer significantly quicker. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's, that's a great tip, one of my, my coworkers almost always does that. He tries to start it. If he knows somebody's not going to be there for like lunch, he'll start the transfer at lunch, but then he'll finish it either th that day later or two, three days later when he's decided. Yeah, two that or three days it. later. Um, the second one is um, hands up those people who know what resource forks are. Okay. Um, that's a quickly dwindling number. That's a good thing. Um, but <laughs> all right, yeah. Our sync, um, the command that you had up there, without the capital E flag, will not transfer resource forks. Um, hopefully, you shouldn't have to ever even care what that sentence I just said means. <laughs> but if if you have somebody who has some older files, um, especially things like really dated Quark Express files. Mm -hmm. It's version 3, version 4, to have been transferred from Mac OS 9 when designers only knew Quark Express. They would never open Word because why would you open Word? You just take notes in Quark. Um, <laughs> I'm dead serious. Oh. Um, and they want that file suddenly opened seven years later, and without the resource fork, that file is destroyed. There is nothing left. Um, and the last one is that that command that you have up there depending on exactly how you're transferring the data, mm -hmm. um, the way that it's written up there, 
assumes that the host operating system actually understands what user is and is actually able to go backwards um, from the username to the actual ID, user mm -hmm. ID, uh, that owns the data. And that, with the ownership questions, probably is one of the significant, quote, issues that people are seeing is that you transfer from this MacBook Pro to this MacBook Pro, we're both user 501 on here. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a collision in Migration Assistant, and it probably will, will change the ownership to 502 or whatever. And, it's, and also with Active Directory, both machines have to respect Active Directory and be doing the same translation of Active Directory user ID to local user ID. Right. Um, so that's a pitfall to watch. Either you could note what the UID is going to be, or you bind to the same directory service, or something to keep those consistent. I suppose that in I should explain that the caveat is our computers are bound to Active Directory, and mm -hmm. so that user short name is already existing in there. Um, and I didn't think about that because the times that I'm mostly using this, uh, I'm doing it either for a local account that I know there's no other local accounts on this machine yet, or uh, it's one from AD. So thank you again. Anybody else want to talk about? We've still got 15 minutes or so. I got like a couple more slides, but not a ton. You want to toss it? Didn't hit anything, but I'm currently going chat. Speaking, uh, can you hear me? This working? Okay. So we, generally speaking, don't transfer directly to the target Mac. We actually transfer to a Linux-based uh, NAS that we have using the CP command with the flags that you you mm -hmm. mentioned. And then we'll either re-image the original computer because that might be why we're doing it, or we'll bring up the new computer, log in as that user, and then we'll just drag and drop the various folders back. Mm -hmm. And we've had very little problems with permissions or anything with regards to that. Yeah, and truthfully, uh, when I use these commands, sometimes I do back up to our network server as well. Um, ours happens to be a Mac server, but it's just because we have a Mac server with a big iSCSI drive connected to it. Um, and so I'll back everything up, and then I just copy it back down. Sometimes uh, I'll just do the same CP command because if the permissions and, and attributes have already been changed, or uh, rather pre preserved, they're not going to change when I do it again. But that's a great tip, too, because sometimes uh, you have to transfer stuff someplace in intermittently when you are replacing maybe a bad drive or you are replacing or re-imaging a machine just because you're getting a new OS or something. Anybody else? All right. So I'll go back to my... Uh, my next slide here. The, uh, the last piece is that there are some other options with cloud backup stuff. Um, they're great for failures, uh, lost or stolen hardware because that stuff is going somewhere. But they tend to be a proprietary desktop application. And it has to be running in order to do the backup. So you have to make sure that that software is still installed and running. Uh, and you have to have those people that I said we weren't going to talk about that know enough to be dangerous. We're going to talk about them for a second. Those people have a tendency to say, oh, crash plan, that's running all the time on my computer. I'm going to, I'm going to uninstall that. And then when their computer dies and there are no backups, they say, but what about crash plan? Well, you uninstalled it. It has to be on and running, and you have to be connected to the network. If your computer is never connected to a network because you don't ever bring it on campus and you're... We have a lot of people, because we live kind of in upstate New York, there's a lot of places where there isn't great cell service or internet availability because there's farm country, there's the Adirondacks. We have a whole program in the Adirondacks. So there's people whose computers don't get connected for months. They just have to realize that that's a caveat. They have to make sure that their stuff is backed up, basically. Um, the last thing about the cloud ones is that it can be slow, depending on the amount of data and the network speed. Even with CrashPlan, if I have a user whose entire folder has to be pulled down, that can take a real long time. Uh, and one thing about CrashPlan specifically is I found that when I'm doing it from the, the console, my session has to stay active. So if I'm downloading a couple hundred gigs, I have to check that box every so often and check that window and make sure that it doesn't fall asleep and then log me out because it's timed out. I think that is a very silly thing, but apparently that's the normal behavior for this version. I don't know. But let's, uh, let's kind of wrap this up. Uh, all the methods work. Do they work the same? No. Uh, 
permissions sometimes are difficult. And like I said, the best way that I found to preserve them is using the command line, making sure that all of that, all those options for permissions, attributes, and everything are, are set correctly. Um, but I do use these, these three methods that I talked about in, in a couple different instances. Um, the fourth one I only use when a drive has failed or a computer is lost or stolen. Um, but I think migration assistant, it's great for a personal machine. If you have a friend or family member who's not tech savvy, having them connect that brings most of their stuff over and it works pretty well. It's not perfect, uh, but it works well enough that you may not have to walk up to them and physically do it for them. I think the drag and drop is a good option for a complicated setup. If you have someone log in to create an account so that you can start, or if you create the folder and shown it with, again, the Active Directory account so we know that it's, it's already going to exist, you can copy things in. And I find that this one has worked pretty well when I have longtime users who do things like store documents folders at the root of the drive. Um, if I drag and drop the stuff from the wrong folder to the right folder, then I know next time I go to transfer it, it's going to work. So hopefully I don't encounter too many of those. But a lot of the people who, who I, I find do that are longtime users, people who've probably been transferring since OS 9. And yeah, everything was different back then. It's just, it's been a long time. They just don't necessarily keep up with it and change the way that, uh, that everybody else does. Uh, the last thing here, the command line, I think it's, a great procedural, like if you want to tell everybody how to do it, you can write the exact steps and everybody can follow them and be pretty successful by making sure that they're using the same commands as everybody else. Um, as I said, that's what I've been using personally. And I guess if I had to choose one, I would say that uh, I like to do rsync more than anything else. Uh, I like to do it in the command line. And again, I like to use that homebrew theme so it looks super cool. With all that text scrolling through. Super. I should have made a video of that. Oh, that would have been cool. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> write that down for next time. Uh, I, I said this already a couple times. The computer is going to do exactly what you tell it to do, but not necessarily what you want it to do. So um, any questions? Really? Nobody? I thought, I thought the pumpkins was so funny. <laughs> ah. Can we pass this back? I don't know if I can throw it that far. I don't know. I think we're going we're gonna to try passing. How's that? <laughs> uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, in our one-to-one, -one, um, what we do when a student breaks their laptop, whether it gets liquid spill or screen damage, they come into the tech center, Okay. and I physically move the hard drive from one machine to another, which I guess is a data transfer, right? <laughs> I didn't even think of that. That is definitely suppose, a way to transfer right? data. <laughs> See, is That's a, the fastest. Is, it, it is the fastest. I can do it in under five minutes now. <laughs> um, and I've actually been training my students to do it. Now, of course, this is a problem with the new hardware that Apple's releasing that has SSDs soldered to the board. Apple, if you're listening, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the second comment um, was, uh, if you don't like the command line, there are a number of GUI tools out there that can do rsync very well. Uh, Sync Pro, mm -hmm. S-Y-N-K Pro is really good. Carbon Copy Cloner, and a few yeah. others. So. I, honestly, I was thinking about, uh, for the hackathon, because I was going to be bored, I was thinking about just making a really quick like checkbox, drag and drop thing so that you can do rsync. I, I might. It's not like it would be hard. But then I feel like there's like 8,000 other things that already do that. So <laughs> the only thing I would be doing is making like two steps less work for me when I do this when I go back. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any fun stories or things that they found that worked that they want to share, like tips, tricks? We've got uh, somebody in the back over there. Thank you for sharing the catch box. <laughs> yeah, so um, I just want to share the fact that we use CrashPlan Pro mm -hmm. uh, and we use the cloud version, so it's not going to local storage, it's going to CrashPlan. Mm -hmm. um, so wherever a user is, as long as they're connected to internet, it works. And we don't do data migrations. We empower the user to do it themselves when they get a new machine. So we- You were lucky. <laughs> we will uh, prep the machine as if it's a brand new computer. Jamf pushes out all the policies, all the settings, all the base software. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we will show them how to go to their CrashPlan portal. And it's up to them to transfer 
all of that, we set crash plan to just back up the entire hard drive. And so all of their stuff is there. Yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great plan. I would love to say that we're not responsible for transferring your data, <laughs> um, but it, it, works, it works well. And we actually have found that on Windows machines, you can actually use it for USMT to use crash plan. It's just, it's not super fast. But it's cool because you don't have to really do a whole lot. Exactly. That's, that's what we've switched to for the last several years. Um, but again, I, there, are people, there are people who complain about it. I, I, can't, I can't lie. There are people who, who don't want it, and then they find department money to upgrade their machine. So their department <laughs> pays for it. Um, just We can certainly pass this around. Just the last slide here. Drop me a line. Uh, my email, awickert at hamilton.edu. This uh, bit.ly is the... Uh, the slide uh, or the uh, presentation feedback. So, if anybody wants to give me any feedback, I would appreciate that. Um, we've got just a couple minutes left. If you guys want to talk, anybody? We've uh, got four minutes. The only thing uh, I've found, uh, a lot of people talked about prep going into it. One of the best things I've found is to just use a GUI wrapper like uh, Onyx mm -hmm. to to wrap for tools and just clean it as best you possibly can. The other nice thing is after a copy, Onyx has a lot of settings that will clean up user level permissions, user account permissions. So it can be also be a post sync yeah. cleanup tool. So you mentioned crash plan several times in here, but mm -hmm. you should also keep your eye on Google. Google's coming out with their uh, drive I guess file it's sync. Kind of like a crash plan type thing where it <laughs> syncs the entire drive to the Google. Uh, cloud, which if you're an education Google Suite user, you've got unlimited space, so that could definitely be a viable option for backup. The uh, the enterprise version of that is the, is, I just said it. Uh, the enterprise version is still in beta, and we've applied for it, but we haven't yet gotten it. Um, I know the it's called like backup and sync or something for home use, um, but the enterprise version is still in beta, and we're waiting to get on that. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that. Uh, you'll be able to actually mount a drive like it's a network drive as well, and then you don't have to store all that stuff locally, which is great for all those people, like I said, that have multi-terabytes of stuff that they need to archive and be able to reach, but don't need it every single day. Is that just an evolution of the Google Drive, or is that something they're going to have in addition to that? I don't know yet. Uh, I, I think it's, it's an added functionality. Uh, how many people are Google campuses? That was the question. I don't know if anybody heard. Oh, what about Microsoft? Huh? You have both? Well, we actually have both, too, uh, because we kind of, like, for people who get home use, they get Office 365 through the education. So we used to offer the they can buy a disk, the education, yeah, the personal like use. Like share, yeah. Share, yeah, like yeah. Google Sheets yeah. is nice, but it's nothing compared to Excel. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right, we're getting into just the last minute here, so I just want to say thank you for everybody to, uh, to come to my pr presentation. It was a really cool thing for me, uh, and I really appreciate it, so thank you. <laughs>